Um, welcome to everybody that's here and we're happy to have uh, the Métis Nation of Ontario to provide this uh, presentation about, you know, workplace opportunities as well as placement opportunities, um, because that is opportunities that our students have. Um, so welcome to everyone. I look forward to hearing your presentation and seeing all the good stuff that's happening in your organization. Thank you. So I believe that I'm up first, so I'm going to uh, just share my screen. Everybody see it? Yeah, okay. Perfect. So um, my name is Jackie Lacknett and I am the employment counselor for Region 5, which is sort of North Bay, Ontario area. Um, we offer a, a giant array of things. And so Linda and I are going to talk to you about that today. Um, first and foremost, we base everything that we do on our statement of prime pur purpose. And there's just a little snippet of it in this uh, slide, but essentially it's um, all about encouraging academic and skills development and to enable citizens of the MNO to attain their educational aspirations. So we're, we're aiming to develop prosperity and economic self-sufficiency to promote our history and values, culture, languages, traditions of the MNO, um, and also just to create a, an awareness of our proud heritage to promote Métis artistic and cultural achievement as well. Um, we have 14 different service uh, locations in Ontario, but we service everywhere. So um, in North Bay, I might have clients from, you know, way down south or way up north. It just sort of depends on how they come to us and how the referrals are made and such. But um, we do have offices in all these locations that are listed on the slide. Um, our, uh, for our piece of the program and programs and services, we have, um, a wide range of supports and programs to support uh, Métis people all across Ontario. The, um, it's a big long name, Indigenous Skills and Employment and Training Strategy. We call it ISETS. It's funded by the Government of Canada and it's a labour market program designed to close earnings and education gap of Métis people. I've um, just highlighted a few of the, I, I guess, most pertinent things. Um, on this slide, I, I will talk a little bit about all of those programs, or Linda and I will, but um, we, we've highlighted the ones that we think kind of make the most sense for your students. Um, as you can see, we love to gather and do all these uh, beautiful cultural activities and get togethers, and I know that everybody's really missing that. Um, it's great to work from home, but it's also, um, it's difficult to not have these uh, these get-togethers. So our, our big one is the training purchase program. And with this um, program, the, the client has to self-identify as Métis or have a citizenship card. Um, we will purchase training for, for people from accredited training institutions. So it has to be a recognized uh, place to learn. Costs can include all sorts of things from tuition, books, supplies, um, exam and certification fees, transportation, childcare, living allowances. Um, we, the, the training is just, um, we will approve it for one year at a time. Um, having said that, two year diploma programs are eligible, but we, we can only approve one year as we go along. Um, at the university level, uh, an MTP or Métis training purchase can only be considered for the final year of an undergraduate university program. Um, so masters and PhDs are not eligible under this particular um, training. Now, I'm going to see if this will allow me to follow this link so that you can see a little bit about this um, PSC program that Linda's going to talk about. Just bear with me. 
Come on. We're going going round and round and round here. Okay. Well, I'm supposed to talk about the, uh, it's loading. Okay. The post-secondary. I'll move it to the next slide there. Um, There you go, Linda. The post-secondary education support program, uh, PSE for short form, is a relatively new program that MNO has developed for the multi-year uh, students. Um, the criteria for that one, uh, you have to be a MNO citizen with a card. You have to live in, in says Canada on here, but I thought it said Ontario. And um, you have to be accepted in a university or college. Um, this is a program that the student can apply for every year. So if they have a three year, they can apply for the three years, but one year at a time. And it is done through the matesonation.org website and they have to reapply every year for it. It's pretty, yeah, that's it. <laughs> so for this, uh, I don't know if you said this or not, Linda, but for this next round of application, um, the next it's going round? to open up. Yeah, it yeah. opens February 17th and closes April 30th. So there's a nice little window there that um, people can apply in, but yeah. I always, tell people like the sooner you apply, the better off you are because, you know, things happen. A, pan a pandemic happened and we never thought that we'd be doing what we're doing now. So you just yeah. never know, right? It's it's important to get it in there as soon as you can. And sometimes they have a budget also that they, they cannot go over. So they have to first come first serve type of deal. And, you know, the sooner the better, like Jackie said. All right, so um, we wanted to tie this um, employability and disability support program sort of into both of those things. Um, what, what these are about, um, so employability program would be to help increase someone's employability through specialized support to reduce existing barriers that they might have. Um, so you can, it's a big slide with lots of uh, information on it, but it uh, talks about, we, we may assist with counseling, financial planning, job search strategies, diagnostic services, job readiness, um, literacy or upgrade materials, supplies to support employment, such as work-related clothing, um, or any, any supplies or tools that are deemed necessary for the client to enter the labor market. Um, the disability support portion of that would um, help any person with a disability to to complete their training or to prepare for or secure and maintain employment. So there's lots of different uh, things that, that might apply there, but things could include things like training, training costs, special equipment, devices, tutoring, transportation, um, fees associated with assessments so that we can tailor uh, programs and services to best um, service the client. So that goes kind of hand in hand with the other um, the other services as well. We have uh, apprenticeship support too. This this is sort of more related to um, the trades or or that sort of thing where, where there would be an apprenticeship involved. But uh, we um, we would help with things like school fees, books, transportation, living away from home. Um, equipment, registration fees, that sort of thing. Um, something that might be of great interest to some of your students would be our wage subsidy and summer career placement program. Um, this will be, I would imagine fairly soon coming out with new applications. We haven't received them as of yet, but um, what it is is basically a, a wage subsidy program that would allow um, individuals to either secure, the idea is that they would secure long-term employment based on um, 
a shorter term wage subsidy with an employer. So the employer takes them on, they work under um, supervision and kind of as a, using it as a learning tool to learn the job and figure out if, if it's really for them. Um, and the employer gets to know them as well. And hopefully they make a good impression and in the end of all of it, wind up with a, a full-time job. And then uh, under the summer career placement, we have, um, it's open to anybody 15 to 30 years old. And we can vary the hours for that. So some people will just do part-time and then others will work full-time. Um, employers have to have payroll capabilities and the student has to be returning to, um, to school in the fall or winter semesters. So um, definitely grab our contact information at the end of this or exchange with us because this is a, a good opportunity for students to get some uh, experience between um, semesters. Or yeah, because we, we've also years of school. Uh, we've had in the past with Laurentian had some summer students. So we just want to keep up that, that partnership. Absolutely. And it can be in any department, uh, administration, registration, anything. So the next slide talks a bit about our culture-based development grant and mobility program. Um, this culture-based development grant is uh, just a one-time only funding. Um, it supports, it's, it says it supports self-determination in an arts and culture related career. Um, we've had clients who are doing things like um, uh, acting and singing and writing books and that sort of thing. And so this is, is really a, a nice tool to help them launch those kinds of careers. Um, it could be somebody that um, creates art or jewelry or you know those kinds of things um, to help them to promote themselves and and sort of get established. The uh, mobility assistance is also I think uh, something that might be of interest. It um, would allow us to help somebody with up to two thousand dollars to um, help them get to where they have a job. So let's say someone from North Bay gets hired um, somewhere in BC and they have to have a flight to go out there um, and they need transportation accommodation while they're traveling um, or, or maybe have to rent a U-Haul to, to bring all their things out there. We can help with that sort of thing. And sometimes that's a barrier for people, you know, if they can't afford to just pick up and go. Um, it can stop them from uh, having a really good opportunity. Now we have a job creation partnership and job shadowing program. With, uh, with this one, the, the training has to relate directly to the employment goal and meet the needs of the industry and labor market. Um, we would provide a living allowance based on, on the wages, the current wages. And it would support the development of employment opportunities to help the community and local economy. Um, we also have a job shadowing program. So sort of similar to the, the wage subsidy idea in that it gives you uh, some on the job experience to help with figuring out what you wanna do and if it's the right career for you. Um, the training has to be related to that person's employment goal. And again, the living allowance would be based on um, their prevailing wages. We, um, right now we're kind of doing a push a bit for our uh, bursary program. Linda's gonna talk a little bit about this one. I'm gonna move it to the next slide for you, Linda. Okay, we have about 42 different um, institutions that are in with the Meets Nation of Ontario bursary at uh, different colleges. The next slide, you'll see the, the names. And this is to support the student that even though <clears throat> they might be getting funding from a source, are still in need of a little bit of money because we, so what we set out is an application that we send to the universities and the colleges 
and um, students apply for it. Uh, there's a process. They come back to the MNO, and then uh, through a committee, it's divided. The um, endowment is it divided between the students that have applied, and then they receive their money. And it's something that, you know, they, they can receive and not have to worry about giving back. It, it, it's almost like a small gift. So that concludes our very condensed. Um, very short and sweet. Very short and sweet. Um, we have uh, included our contact information right at the end here. So um, if you have any questions that we didn't cover or you have something that, uh, you know, questions involving a particular situation, by all means, reach out to either Linda or myself. We, we both do the same, uh, the same work. So she, she's based in Sudbury and I'm in North Bay. Um, and then our, the supervisor of education and training, Rochelle, her contact information is on there as well. So I'm going to stop screen sharing, maybe if I can figure out how to do it. Sherry, did you have any questions for Linda and Jackie in regards to student placements or anything like that? Were, are, do you mean, I got to put my nose into this one. Do you mean um, having placement at the MNO? Or, yeah, or even with the um, the subsidized um, income that you were talking about. Shouldn't if that's okay with everybody. Um, so we typically take on between five and ten interns a year. Um, that's kind of like our placement within the MNO, and it's really dependent upon you know what branches need interns. Um, it's a one year contract, um, fully paid. The requirements are. They need to self-identify as Métis and have graduated within the last six months or will graduate in the, in the next six months. And we have some information. Um, we have a flyer to give to you to disseminate to students. And I've also got um, Jay and Wendy. Jay is one of our hiring managers from our largest branches in the MNO. And Wendy is a hiring manager from our mental health and addictions program, which is always growing. So. I'm going to hand it off to them if they wanted to just briefly talk about what they look for in um, student placements and potential um, employment opportunities as well. So, you, want you want to go first, Jay? I may as well. Thanks, Wendy. I'll be brief and I'll let you take us home from there. I'm going to share a screen as well for a minute. So the uh, Métis Nation of Ontario does feature a lot of really vibrant, dynamic programs across branches. Wendy and I are part of uh, the biggest branch in MNO, the Healy and Wellness branch. And we have uh, quite a suite of diverse programs. So whether you're looking for actual support for yourselves, your families, your loved ones, want to come in for a placement, just get to know a little bit more about uh, what's going on as far as services. We really do offer quite a bit of, of information. Um, I will say off the top, I, uh, I've been with the MNO 22 going on 23 years, and there is just lots of room to grow. So as we're here recruiting kind of the brightest and best uh, voices for tomorrow, it's an awesome place to have a career. I couldn't have asked for a better better place for my journey for the past uh, couple of decades. I started on the front line as we do, you know, as a community wellness worker, lots of training, experience, lots of support internally, <clears throat> um, became a supervisor of that program. And later on, um, you know, you kind of, Find your, find your path, find your passion. And, and I took on a role as a manager now as well for the branch. So really it is a great place to be. It's a great place to come either for employment or placement, lots of, lots of things to do. Really quickly um, about our branch. So just interestingly, interesting, uh, interestingly enough, um, our branch used to be called the health branch. 
And we just generally like to share that it wasn't really diverse enough to describe what the, the branch really does. We got a lot of calls for a few years in the early iterations of, of the healing and wellness branch where people thought we were more of a medical or a, a gym or a spa type of an environment. So over time, you know, we talked it through with management and, and our knowledge holders, changed the branch to healing and wellness to really reflect that sense of balance and, and the kind of the broader scope of what we do as a group. What kind of services do we do in the branch? Uh, really quickly, we have three really primary pillars of output or, or types of activities, if you will. The main thing that we do is what we call client-based services or client-based activities. <clears throat> and they're what you think of as, as working with individuals and families directly, whether doing some services yourself, connecting them through um, system navigation to get them to some experts, um, basically taking the, the needs and challenges that the, the families bring to us and getting people to start their, their healing journeys and supporting them through it. We also do uh, a lot of participant gatherings and the purpose of a gathering, such as like a workshop or a community event or a celebration is to really find ways to get that culturally relevant, culturally sensitive messaging out so that we're getting people more skills, more knowledge. We're uh, helping them create healthier behaviors, healthier attitudes about things and just growing their perspective and their access to the community and the stakeholders of the Métis Nation. And finally, we try and do a lot of things around um, networking and, and enhancing our cultural hubs. So, you know, go out and build community relationships, establish community partners, um, external collaborations, and really building that, uh, that culturally vibrant environment that people have to, to come in and do their thing. We have Métis space for Métis people and our allies. Come on into the spaces and see what the culture is all about. The services are yours, you know, by you, for you. Uh, our branch really has two levels or two primary types of support. I'll talk about the first and Wendy the second. <coughs> um, when we're looking at kind of the, the, uh, the community-based or systems navigation supports or non-expert services, there's quite a suite of, of programs I'll go over briefly. These are our uh, jobs or placement opportunities. You can come into m &O, basically take your orientation, hit the ground running, and you're kind of the primary face of getting in there and and working with the programs, the clients to help people come up with their own paths, develop their own healing journeys and kind of engage all of our knowledge holders and culture in the right way. We also have clinical partnerships or more of an expert level partnership as well. Um, Wendy has uh, just an amazing suite of services along this line of, of support. Uh, there's still a lot of system navigation and referrals and the same type of support you'd expect from, from the community facing programs except that it goes a little bit further into services where we are able to connect you with, um, with experts, you know, counselors, psychologists, kind of the, the next step, the next piece. So getting you everything you need along your journey. Don't want to steal any more thunder from Wendy, so I'm just going to move on to our service locations. Our branch, um, basically north to south, east to west, we, um, we service the entire province and we have... Um, we have service or cultural hubs in, in so many communities. We have 32 or 33 primary hubs listed on the screen here. Uh, you know, our leadership's always looking for ways to improve and expand. They're doing some great work there. Um, if you ever can't find your community on the kind of the list at the time, just pop on to our, our website, uh, www.metination.org, uh, Healing and Wellness, and you'll have the current list of everything there. We can serve you provincially and remotely too. So if you're not in one of these communities, it's no problem we'll find someone to serve you the best way from a remote location. So you're gonna get what you need. It's a couple of clicks away at most. Okay, so I'll talk quickly about some of the, the programs that we do have to offer. One of them is the Healthy Babies, Healthy Children program. This is a program that uses home visits uh, to go and, and bring culture into people's homes, into families' environments to give them that best opportunity to thrive. Looking at parenting supports, um, different types of, of education that families might need play-based learning opportunities for children, making sure that the, you know, the developmental milestones are met and getting people referred out to those experts when, when it needs to be. It's a really great program, a wide open, so connecting to, to all culture through stories and different activities, really focused on families having the best, best chance to thrive, the best chance to have that great start. And most of the work is done from the primary areas of, of the family, so generally their home and, and the main places that they tend to be. We have the Métis Family Wellbeing Program in place to, to address some really important um, areas of need in the community. So when we have families who, um, 
who have children or youth in care, children or youth who are involved in the justice system, or families who have recently experienced violence or trauma, we have a full suite of staff in the family well-being program designed to go in, work, identify the points of need, um, get the plans of support going so that we can get those children and families out of care and repatriate back to kind of the safest, most culturally vibrant place to be together. We, we make sure that we have opportunities for, for youth to both um, end their involvement in the justice system and not get there in the first place. This, this program really focuses on better choices, better opportunities to kind of prevent things. It's very preventative. So um, it could even be, you know, putting together like a sports league for kids to go to after school when they're, you know, their parents might still be working. Better to be, you know, playing sports with some people in culture than to, uh, than to be out getting into a little bit of trouble, right, in the community or whatever it may be that the community desires. The Community Wellness Worker Program. Uh, this program is about addressing the impacts of the full spectrum of violence in communities, helping people find their voice and their role in preventing it and in making a better world for the people around them. So uh, whatever needs uh, people may present with, whether they need support because they've been in crisis or trauma, we'll help you take those first steps and connect you to the experts as well. We'll connect you to the cultural pieces and, and activities that you need. But we'll also do things around your community, make sure that we're doing lots of activities just to celebrate culture together, to build those cohesive communities that are able to better gather better support one another to thrive and heal when need be, looking at ways to address any of the unique uh, occurrences that might come up for people and really pulling that cultural lens into perspective. So what's my role in making a healthier community? What's my role in helping our people, you know, heal and be healthy and thrive? And what's my role in, in being a role model and getting more messaging out? Community support services. This program is for the uh, elderly and the chronically ill. And it's focused around making sure that people have that fair, equitable opportunity to get the services they need in order to be healthy and, and vibrant for as long as they can, ideally staying at home or in their preferred environment. But those barriers that we know geographically, culturally, financially exist, we make sure people get transportations to uh, medical services, support with consultations so they understand paperwork or, or medical jargon. Um, a little bit of in-home and planning and respite care for, for care providers for the elderly or chronically ill. And opportunity again to always move on and connect to experts as, as need be. Uh, we have an aging at home program. <clears throat> this is targeted very specifically to helping our people, our seniors and our elders stay at home as long as they can. Making sure that they're able to and that it's safe to do so. A couple of, uh, of services we do. One, we, uh, we go right into home help these people out, kind of do an environmental scan of their home, make sure everything's safe, everything's clean, everything's up to minimum standards, teach them how to, you know, how to, to be where they're at and, and do what they can. And we kind of find other ways to fill in the rest. We also uh, help out with some really huge barriers in service, um, lawn care and snow removal. A lot of times these two barriers, um, they, they have an impact on, 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 on our people's ability to access emergency services and even stay at home. Just as you know, simple as a safe lawn and a shoveled driveway in the winter makes all the difference in making sure that emergency services are able to get to people who may otherwise be isolated. And it just helps people stay safely at home for a longer period of time. Uh, <clears throat> we have a CAPC program for children. And uh, this is very similar to our Healthy Babies program. Again, it's all about getting the, um, getting the right access to tools, information, culture, and all those things are gonna help a family have the best start to thrive, to get going. But instead of like the Healthy Babies program where we kind of go to the family spaces, CAPC does it in reverse and we pull families into our cultural spaces and activities. So it's very heavily uh, gathering based. Our coordinators for the program really do an excellent job putting on celebrations, uh, play-based learning activities, family nutrition circles, getting the community to gather together in their own space to experience culture so that you're getting the, the full picture. You get healthy baby supports at home in your environment, but you also get a taste of, of that kind of that congregate sense of community that is really such a part of our culture, getting out and experiencing the, the spaces and activities. And finally, if, um, if direct client service isn't really your bag, we have lots of other things to do too. We have a suite of health promotion services that are, um, that are as much augmentative and educative as, as they are directly front-facing for client supports. 
these activities do provide limited, uh, limited amount of client support in different ways, but they're also in place to create really, um, really interesting and culturally vibrant too. I say vibrant a lot because it is, but these tools and workshops, um, starting with research and not just um, clinical research, but grassroots assessments and sharing circles to get the information that the community wants, the messaging that the community needs according to whatever topic they need. They build tools, they do, uh, create different teaching lenses. So you might have one message about cancer and then they find ways to have parents teach their children about cancer, children teach their, their peers about cancer, et cetera. Uh, really activity-based and immersed in kind of our story work and our, our cultural practices, a lot of outdoors activities. But the, the gist of these programs is um, community-based research and self-assessment, developing tools and education, developing training sessions for our staff, for our frontline team, as well as the, you know, our service providing partners, the general community, and just finding new ways to find, to make it stick. We always kind of ask, how do we make the, the value of our good work stick? And the kind of our health promotion services, uh, they really take the kind of the leadership role in finding those ways to find that lens that help people see themselves in the services so they're more active in being a part of it. We have um, health promotion services for victim services, anti-human trafficking, um, legalized cannabis, uh, tobacco, and very recently uh, diabetes has been added to the docket. It just keeps growing and expanding. And uh, yeah, so really a great opportunity to, to learn a little bit more. Like I said, if you wanna know more, uh, just pop onto that website, metisnation.org, or you can email me directly, jasonj at metisnation.org. And I'm gonna turn things over to Wendy now to talk about the, the other half of services in our branch. All right, now I have to like follow that. Holy cow. Okay, I need to just get my second screen up and share. Bear with me, guys. Okay. Except I just shared the wrong screen. Share screen. Can you guys see this? You guys can see that, yeah? Awesome, okay. So just highlighting, uh, highlighting Jay's, oh God, this is on a slide thing. So guess what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna get out of the slide thing until I can figure out how to stop it from doing what it's doing and just do this. Um, at the end of the day, the, and these slide decks are available for you guys to send to students. But at the end of the day, what I wanted to just touch base on was the fact that under healing and wellness, as Jay has already commented on, they provide a broad range of services, broad array. When they encounter mental health and addiction services for clients, um, they have the ability to come to us and actually seek specialized services. So um, just to highlight, we've done a lot of community engagement with our, uh, our communities regarding what services the Métis communities want. And at the end of the day, um, there were six pillars of services that our programs were predicated on. Access to care that's relevant and culturally based for Métis, collaboration amongst partners, education and training for mainstream providers to know about who Métis are and services that might be available for Métis, having access to appropriate clinical services. So as you may or may not know, um, Métis are spread across the province of Ontario, remote, urban, um, in some cases so remote even off the grid. So we need to be able to be nimble enough to provide specialized services to every single Métis citizen residing in this province of Ontario. And this program has really, I think, uh, you know, been a, a key player in terms of some broader system changes in the mental health system. So we now have a mental health systems navigator that sits at the provincial table, uh, working with the ministries, uh, provincially and federally, as well as other indigenous and mainstream partners in terms of uh, providing efficient and effective mental health and addiction services. We also, um, I've got an article uh, that's been composed that really is the 
kind of the foundational documents to our program. Um, so again, from an academic perspective for students that might be interested in terms of how did this program come to be and, you know, why not taking in, you know, pan-Indigenous approach is harmful. Um, you know, so again, we, you know, predicate ourselves on being grounded in evaluation and significant community engagement, but also efficacy of the program and demonstrating that we can actually deliver the services to who, to how, and to what outcome. Um, again, you know, I'm speaking to the converted here, but at the end of the day, the program also predicates itself on, um, you know, engaging the pillars of wellness. Uh, so accessing our healing and wellness, as well as education and training and other programs within each respective community, even community councils that might be part of somebody's wellness program with us. Um, access to their community and of course, access to the resources. Our programs are delivered virtually, always have been. Um, we do have the ability to do lots of face-to-face -face as well, but in terms of being able to access efficient and effective, you know, access to mental health and addiction specialist, most of our program is delivered under uh, video conference technologies and in most cases with Physicians Ontario Telemedicine Network. Um, and by able to, by being able to do that, we're actually able to be nimble. So we assess what clients needs are and based on those needs, we can actually develop specific wraparound, you know, provisions for that individual. So it's not like it's a provider driven service. This is truly a client centered driven service. So depending on what your strengths and needs are, we then bring in the right clinician and it could be many, could be a complete interdisciplinary team that actually becomes part of your care plan. The program has the ability to uh, deliver equivalent to hospital services without the walls. So we are able to address the needs of folks with mild to moderate to severe and chronic mental health and addictions issues. Um, we partner with agencies that do residential treatment. We partner with specialists that, you know, provide, um, you know, Forensics assessments, for example, specialized youth assessments, neural, you know, developmental, behavioral, uh, autism assessments. So we have all sorts of specialist dependence on what needs that presents before us. So students would have the ability to either choose, uh, either going into our child and youth program, which is servicing zero to 17, and then of course we have our adult program, which is 18 years and above. Um, so I'll get into what the services are specifically, but because of the nature of the program, um, we are required to demonstrate the efficacy of the program. So it costs a lot of money. Does it work? What's it doing? Um, is it achieving the outcome, not only for the clients, but for the funders? So in terms of students, um, you know, they actually have the opportunity to see the clinical provision of care, but also through evaluation as well as our, we're developing a lot of our um, client records management system. So, you know, just being part of that iterative process and seeing how uh, live program evaluation works, it's uh, something that's key. Um, so clearly just, I guess, let's talk a little bit about what the services are. So we have teams of navigators, basically mental health case managers, that as soon as somebody enters into our program, either in most cases through healing and wellness, um, we often get referrals, but sometimes we get referrals directly from communities or community councils. Um, we do a quick intake and our team right now, we have 11 navigators of children and adult navigators that stay with the client. So for example, Linda, you could say, hi, I'd like a referral. We assess you and say, welcome to the MNO. And we're with you along your journey to mental wellness. Um, and let's collectively develop a care plan. So our staff are trained in uh, the comprehensive needs and strengths assessment tool that we use with clients to help develop their unique care plans. And in those care plans, um, are the mental health specialists that we have access to are psychiatry, psychology, social work, 
parenting coaches, behavioral specialists, addictions counselors, you know, psychotherapists. I mean, you name it, we have it. Um, these are not all people that are on staff with us. We could never afford this. Um, but these are all people that through the duration of this program, which started in 2017, um, you know, really, um, everyone's with us. They have training to know that when they deliver services to the Métis Nation of Ontario, they know who Métis are, they actually know who the MNO is, and they know what services are provided. So the case managers, and I would, most times when we take students, um, usually we assign them to a case manager and we actually give the students like live access to files so that you actually get a feel for what it's like to manage. Um, you know, obviously you're under the supervision of our navigators and depending on, uh, we also have certified addictions counselors and I'm also a master's in social work and have been supervising students and I teach at Carleton. So, um, certainly have a comprehensive uh, supervision uh, experience, I guess, in terms of managing students as well. But students would get a full comprehensive aspect in terms of how a comprehensive interdisciplinary team would work. Um, so it kind of it depends on what the students interests are. If they're just interested in evaluation and research, we have a whole evaluation platform. We can do a hybrid of um, evaluation slash, you know, uh, live interactions with clients. Um, again, it just depends on students' needs and we're certainly, uh, you know, um, open and amenable. This is just a quick snapshot of kind of how the growth trajectory of the program has been. Um, so although um, when I came in 2016, there was a program that was in existence, it was uh, half a day that's it. Um, that's all the ministries would fund us for at the time. And so it took a lot of um, engagement and slow incremental growth for the ministries to finally fund a Métis specific mental health and addictions program. We have our clinicians, uh, are, some are mainstream, some are Métis, we have bilingual, we have a full range of services available so that also clients get to choose. As we know, the Métis community is small, not necessarily everyone's comfortable having a Métis therapist because they know them. Um, so we really do pride ourselves on fully being client-centered. We help the client recognize, you know, where their strengths are and where their areas of opportunity are and giving them a full suite of clinicians available to work with us to help them recover and achieve their goals that they wish to achieve. Uh, we don't work in isolation. So many of our clients also have multiple factors, housing, other health issues, uh, education, work. So this is again where students would have the opportunity to not only see the mental health aspects of things, but also have that opportunity to branch with other programs in the MNO to collaborate and make sure those needs of those clients are met. But just quickly here, um, just for poops and giggles in terms of COVID, I think everybody here has stated that the organization has been able to pivot really quickly. Um, and this is just a quick sample, not even, you know, through a full fiscal year, we have already well surpassed our deliverables. The number of referrals that we're receiving is, we just can't keep up. So, um, this is not a program for the faint of heart. Um, the files that come to us are pretty intense. And with the volumes that we have, students, you know, who tend to be a little bit more mature, um, if they require hand-holding, this is not a placement for them. Um, for a few reasons, one of which is not only the nature of the work, but because especially right now, and who the heck knows when we're going back, uh, no one's in an office with them at the moment. So again, it's a lot to process. And, you know, um, as we're all busy trying to deliver services, to be able to supervise a student virtually with this nature of work does require somebody who's, you know, a little bit more skilled and grounded. Um, again, how to make referrals to our program. Uh, we have non-urgent referral process, and then we also have a crisis line. So the beauty of this is our navigators are not specifically dealing with the mental health crisis and actually 
providing the mental health treatment. They are part of the plan. They are the, I want to, I don't want to say the masters of it, but they are the coordinators of care for that client. And so, um, as you all know, the journey to mental wellness ebbs and flows. So um, somebody could be doing well for a period of time. Uh, and then during our provision of care, we find they decompensate and all of a sudden we need to implement bringing in psychiatry or ramping up other services to support them. And then of course, in periods when they're well, we wean off other services. So again, it's a real nice uh, way to see what you know proactive uh, and engaged case management looks like in the mental health realm without having to fear you know if somebody's in crisis feeling like you have to deal with the crisis we actually have tools to help folks one of the other things that we pride ourselves in most recently is we do have a lot of staff education that's available for mental health training um, in addition, we've, uh, because of COVID, we weren't gathering and needed to look for some quick ways to deliver education differently. So the MNO actually has public education events that are available now for anyone to pop onto. It is dedicated really for Métis communities, but if students are interested, if you're interested as a facilitator with the university and want to see what we're up to, you're welcome to go to our website and actually sign up and link on to our, um, our webinars. And on that note, guys, that's my two cents. Um, I'm not sure if there were any folks following after us. Thank you so much, Wendy and Jay, for taking time out of your schedule to be with us. Um, so Cynthia will be sending you an employment uh, flyer with some of our information that could be disseminated to students. And thank you, Jackie and Linda, talking about all the awesome employment resources that we have. So thanks everybody. Thanks everybody, that was really good. It's nice to, to hear from everyone because we don't gather or haven't been gathering so much. Um, we kind of miss out a little bit on some of the stuff that's going on in the other branches too. So it's really good to, to get updates. Yeah, and if some of your students have questions, just send them to us okay, and we'll answer them. Perfect, I see we have one student here. I'm not too sure if they have a question. Diane, did you have a question for anybody? Okay, I guess not. Uh, well, I just wanna say thank you for all of you for taking your time out to come and present um, this presentation to our students. Uh, I will, we will be posting it on our, our, some of our social media platforms. So I could definitely let you know um, who, you know, how many people have viewed it. It's a wealth of information. Um, we also have your uh, career fair, like your career, um, uh, where they would look for careers on our platform, on our D2L platform. So students have access to that as well. And, and I try and post um, any jobs that come our way for sure. Uh, and I've definitely seen a growth in your organization over the last, uh, you know, few years. Um, and it's awesome to see so many great programs. And, and some of them that you mentioned, I just actually learned about, you know, I think about a couple of months ago that they actually existed. So that's pretty amazing. So miigwech, thank you. And um, look forward to seeing you all again sometime in the near future. Maybe uh, you can come onto campus and not be virtual. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Take care.